In this video and the next few videos, we are going to be looking at diffraction and interference. Now, this is very important to explain how Young proved that light is a wave, or that EMR is a wave that we learned earlier. So, before we get into that, we have to know what is diffraction. Diffraction is the change in shape and direction of a wavefront as a result of encountering a small opening or aperture in a barrier or corner. Well, now, before we even get too young, we have to look at this guy here, Christian Hewen, a Dutch guy. So, he came up with this principle. It, his principle was a model of wave theory, which predicts the motion of a wave front as being many small point sources propagating outward in, co in concentric circle at the same speed as the wave itself. Well, what does that mean? Well, this is what it means. So here's the first little part here. Here we have my point source, right? And as this point source goes out, we, my wave goes out like this, we have infinite point sources along the wave. So there's a little point source, each point is a point source along the wave. And then it's going to go out more, making more point sources. Now if I look at this too, I want you to think about this, because eventually our waves can be look like straight lines, if they propagate out far enough. So from here, this point here is very straight compared to this section, okay? And these are making new point sources. So eventually they can appear to be straight lines as we will see in examples I'll show you here soon. So you will have to know how to draw this out and understand that each wave has point sources. And here's my wavelength, between these is my wavelength. So let's look at my second one. Now, this diagram here is if we have uh, diffraction around a corner. Okay, so let's look at what diffraction looks like around a corner over here. So I have a little diagram here and we have some diffraction around the corner. I could change this. So if I decrease my wavelength, which means my, my lines get closer together, it's going to look like so. Okay, I'm going to decrease it a little bit more and there goes my lines. Now if I increase my wavelength, they bend even more like so. And it's going to continue here soon. So you have to understand this. If we look, here's a corner. My waves are coming in. We have big wavelengths. That means big there. And it bends around the corner like this. So, And if we look very closely, we see some stuff here. Because this becomes a new point source right at that point of that corner. And it propagates out that way. That's why it makes it look rounded. Because remember, we said each of these waves have many point sources among them. So it hits the corner and it propagates out from here. So right there, there's my wave propagating out that way. So that's the whole idea of it because there's point sources on these. So now let's next look at my next part. And this is when we're going through a hole. So we're going to look at what's happening when we go through a slit. This is the third one. Okay, so long wavelengths through narrow slits. And that's going to look like this here. So here we go. I have these wavelengths. Remember, we come out here and then we get a very interesting little thing here. We get a huge propagation. It starts curving because this is a point. So the slit width now can change and make some very interesting things. So when I make it smaller, it's more round. But watch what happens when I make it a really, really, really big point. Okay, so now I have a huge opening. Okay, and I'm going to also improve my contrast a bit here. Okay, and now look what happens. It kind of looks like I have many little waves. Because here now, look at how there's these little bumps and we have one like there. It's like we have several points that are interfering with themselves, making it a wider curve. Okay, because remember, this is like saying we have one point according to Higgins here, 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 and their interference has now changed. I'm going to change this width and make it a bit smaller. So now maybe we only have three points interfering with each other, making different waves, okay? All right, so now that we're done those, let's go back. Let's go back here and just to remember. So remember there, is, there, there was still this debate. So remember there was still this debate. Was light a particle, which moves like bullets, pool balls, and so on? And this belief was of Newton, very famous. He's like the giant. Or was it 
a wave with crests and troughs put forth by young, by young, a physics nobody. Well, we are going to look at Young's experiment and see how he proved himself correct. So let's try and explain this through an analogy. So we're going to start off here and we're going to use the particle theory first. And we're going to discuss what would happen if it's particles with two slits. So first we're going to have a machine gun to represent bullets being the particles being shot out and two armor plates, okay, with two small slits. And we're going to label the slits one and two. A detector, a small labeled black stop, like what we said, two armor plates. And the detector is going to be something quite simple. This detector here is just going to be a can filled with sand so it could catch and collect the bullets. Okay. Now, we will turn the gunner loose for, let's say, one minute burst and then see how many bullets arrive in the can. We empty the can and then move the can Okay, and move it to a different position or backstop. Uh, the turn... Uh, and we then turn the gunner loose again for one minute and see how many bullets have arrived in the new position. And we're going to keep on repeating this procedure over and over to determine the distribution of bullets in different positions of the backstop. Now, however, when we turn the gunner loose, the gunner will be drunk. So he sprays the bullets randomly in every direction. Just like how they say uh, light is. It propagates in every direction light. It doesn't just go in one straight line, it goes in every direction. Okay, so we'll do two different experiments with the same equipment. So let's take a look at my first experiment. So first, we close one of the two slits and measure the distribution of bullets arriving at the backstop. And we get a nice little bell curve that looks like this for the amount of bullets when we curve it. Okay, then next we're going to do the other slit. Now we open the second slit and we get a bell curve over here that looks like this. All right. Now if we look at this, based on superposition, we have both slits open and we're shooting randomly. Remember, it's a drunk driver, just shooting randomly. We're going to look get something that looks like this. So we have both of those original bell curves and we're going to add them together and we'll end up getting superposition. And we basically get this nice bell curve where most of the bullets are going to land up in here and few going out. Okay? So it's just like what we have predicted. So now we're going to turn our attention to waves. If we were in physics class, I have a device called a ripple tank, which is just a tank made of plexiglass, which could be filled with water. Various devices would tap the surface of the water, causing the water waves to spread out from the device. You have seen this as I demonstrated some parts of it in Physics 20, but you also know my ripple tank is getting a little bit damaged over the years. One may insert slits uh, and other objects in the path of the waves. The whole apparatus is mounted. I can mount it on an overhead projector, so it could be used to demonstrate in class. I absolutely love this ripple tank as you saw in Physics 20, so physics class can basically be water play. So we'll have to replay repeat this double slit experiments here on an example. So in this case here, we have a point source, right? And I have two slits. And there I'm going to have a detector. So first we show the apparatus. The thing that is tapping the surface of the water is a little black circle. In the middle of all this, concentric circles. The concentric circles are the water wave spreading out and my wavelength is between each crest of the circle. From crest to crest is wavelength. So just before we have the two slits and a backstop, just in front of the backstop is our detector, which is just a cork floating on the surface of the water. We measure how much cork the cork bobs up and down to determine the amount of wave energy arriving in that position in the backstop. Moving the cork to other positions will allow us the same determination of distribution of the wave energy at the backstop. So, we continue this here. Now, we close one of the slits and measure the distribution of the wave arriving at the backstop just from the upper slit from, uh, for some combinations of the slit and width and wavelength, there will be significant spreading of the waves after it passes through the slit. If you have ever observed a surf coming through a relatively small slit in a seawall, you may have observed this observation. 
The distribution is shown by the curve, and note that it is very similar distribution to the bullets. So right here is my curve. It is very similar to the bullets as we have a little uh, point source. Now, we do it again from the second point source, and we get a very similar distribution to the bullets as well. But when both point sources are open, we get something very, very, very intriguing. We end up getting something called an interference pattern. So, what is that? Well, we have these both slits here, and we notice the waves interfere with each other. It doesn't turn out like when we use the machine gun with bullets, which represents the particle theory. The two uh, waves, the two curves, bell curves, don't build on each other. Here, at some times, they interact positively, where we add them together. Sometimes, they are destructive interference. So we have two types of interference. We have destructive interference, where, when they, where they are opposites of each other, and we have constructive interference, where they build on each other. Okay? So, we go back here, we end up getting a graph like this blue one, where we have destructive interference, constructive interference, destructive interference, and constructive interference. Then huge constructive interference, huge destructive interference. So this completes the operational definition that we need to define waves and particles. In the two-slit experiment, a particle does not show an interference pattern. And the probability of a particle arriving at a location is just when we open two slits, is you just add the two original bell curves together. Whereas a wave pattern shows an interference pattern, where you have constructive and destructive interference. Young did the experiment with this light going through two slits and observed a certain pattern. He observed not the particle pattern, where we had only constructive inter when we just constructed and we added the two bell curves together, he deserved bright and dim nodes. So this is what he looked like when he had the double slit. So we have brighter nodes here and then weaker on the outside. But look, we have a definite bright fringes or anti-nodes were regions of constructive interference, and dark fringes or nodal lines were regions of destructive interference. Therefore, double, Young's double slit experiment provided strong evidence needed for the acceptance of a wave model of light. So let's take a look here. This is what happens when a particle is shot through. Okay. Then soon we're going to see what happens when a wave goes through. <laughs> So now we're going to waves and look at the interference pattern it is making here. So we end up getting something like that. We get nodes and anti-nodes. And then we're going back to a particle where we just get randomly shot throughout where most will be in the middle. So to understand mathematically how the interference pattern is created, let's consider this image here. So we have the distance between two different slits there. So we have the length, right? So we have my path length, we have a distance between two different slits. So how many wavelengths does it take to get to the screen? Well, I look at this here, my path wavelength, my path length is three wavelengths. So we have one, two, three to get to my screen, okay? So the distance uh, from slit to screen is going to be 1. So altogether, the path difference is 0 wavelengths for both of these. So now if I look at this here, we have 3 wavelengths, 3 wavelengths, the path difference is 0 wavelengths. So if there's 0 wavelengths altogether, this means we are going to end up getting something called constructive interference which is at the central node, which is going to be our maximum interference. So now let's consider one with different paths. So the first thing we must know is how many wavelengths does the top one have? Well, let's see how many the top one has. I have one, two, three, and I don't know, something, and it's going to tell me it's going to be 3.75. Doesn't look like it's quite full. Next, I want to know how many wavelengths does the bottom one have? 
So let's do this again here. I'm going to check. I get 3.25. Well, let's double check. We have one, two, three, and yeah, that looks like a quarter. Okay? So altogether, my path difference is half a wavelength. Now, a node is a point of interaction between waves at which only destructive interference occurs. And interference pattern nodes occur at paths at different intervals of one half wavelengths. So this right here is a complete destruction interference because we have half a wavelength difference so that means we're going to have complete destructive interference. If we look at it, when this one's going down, this wavelength is going to be going up. So they are complete destructive interference, so we end up getting absolutely a node, whereas the other one showed a anti-node. So this is your first little bit of project. Now your questions to do are these five questions here, which you can find in here.